As we focus our attention toward God's word, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. So we paused last week for our week of spiritual emphasis as we looked at the armor of God together, but we are back in the Beatitudes this week and looking at verse 5. As we think about these Beatitudes, we've been reminded of the truth that they are to be taken in concert together. I would just ask you today, if you would consider yourself meek, are you meek? Now, there are a few different ways that you might look at that. Meek is not really a word we use much in our society today. And so when we come to God's word and we see it translated, blessed are the meek, well, we might have a little trouble with that. Or you might even think right off, you know, I'm not meek at all. I don't think I have that trait in me at all. Or maybe you think that you're meek and and maybe you're really not. And so this morning, what we want to come away with is a firm understanding of what meekness is. Because as we look at these Beatitudes, here's the reminder that we have. They are not options, right? They're not character traits in the sense that they're personality traits, something that you're born with. And well, you know, if you just weren't born meek, then I guess there's really not much hope for you then, right? No, meekness is something that we cultivate through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life because these beatitudes, and I can't emphasize this enough, these beatitudes, they are the norms of the kingdom. They are the norms of what it is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And so if you don't see these things present in your life, then guess what you need to be working on? You need to be working on cultivating them. And it's not something we do in our own strength. We do it through the work of the Lord in us. And so Matthew chapter 5, this morning we want to read verse 1 through verse 20 as we look at, at excuse me, verse 11, uh, verse 12. I'll get it right in a minute. Uh, through verse 12 as we consider together these beatitudes. But today particularly we're going to be focusing on verse 5. One of my favorite stories, I, I love mountain climbing. I've never climbed a mountain. I don't plan on ever climbing a mountain. Uh, but I enjoy watching documentaries about people who have climbed mountains and done incredible feats like that. And, of course, in the world of mountain climbing, Sir Edmund Hillary is a legend, right? Uh, he, along with uh, Sherpa Tenzig Norgay, were the first men to ever summit Mount Everest, an incredible feat in their day. It still remains an incredible feat as we consider that. But along this line of meekness, it was that one day um, a group of climbers, uh, they were out on a mountain somewhere and, and they were uh, kind of staging up and, and they came across Sir Edmund Hillary. He was there. And so they asked him if he would take a picture with them to which he obliged. And as they were beginning to get set up for the picture, Um, To their horror, an individual was walking by and saw them unaware of who was there. And this individual walked up to Sir Edmund Hillary, who was holding a pickaxe in his hand, and proceeded to correct him on the proper way to hold the pickaxe. And so he, he positioned it in his hand and explained to him, this is the proper way to hold it. Now you would think Sir Edmund Hillary might look at that guy and say, do you know who I am? Right? Do, you, do you realize who you're talking to here? They said they were amazed that he, you know, Sir Edmund Hillary, just smiled at the individual, went on about taking his picture. No other words were ever said about it. And everyone was amazed at the way that he did that. I think that's a small picture of what meekness is. Now, as we think about it in a biblical term, in a biblical scope, right, certainly spiritually in our lives, there is a a far, much a much larger ranging way that meekness works its way into us. But the impulse not to correct, the impulse of humility, the impulse to be gentle and mild is a piece of what meekness is. But we might in the midst of our lives, and I think this is probably true, and look, I'll tell you this is a way of confession. I don't know that I've thought much about how meekness works its way and plays out in my life, but we might run through life and never stop to consider the quality of meekness that should be evident in our lives. 
And if we do, then we're missing out on a blessing. Because remember, the beginning of each of these beatitudes is that there is a blessed state that results from them. Now, I would tell you this, meekness comes with a very definite conviction about the future. Right? But there is a blessed state, a blessing that comes from meekness being demonstrated in our life. And if I could just tell you today that the part of this whole fallen reality that we're examining, that we might run through life and never even stop to consider whether or not we're meek or try to cultivate this quality of meekness in our life, our world rages around us. And if we're not careful, it will push meekness right on out of us. It will stop us and squash any type of mild or gentle nature that is in us. So we must counter that with God's word. And thankfully what Jesus is showing us in the Beatitudes is the picture of how we live and in this whole demonstration of meekness being part of the norms of the kingdom, the beauty is that we also see it present in Jesus' life. So read with me if you would in Matthew chapter 5. It says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven." For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We've looked at two Beatitudes already. Moving on now to a third one, being poor in spirit and mourning. And it's been reflected on as you look at these that it is really the first two Beatitudes that set the stage for meekness to be cultivated in our hearts and lives. There is a sense in which these Beatitudes are progressive in our life, meaning that one builds on another to help generate what we see described to us in them. And so if you would say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this whole idea of meekness and whether it's present in my life, maybe you know there's nothing meek about me, ask yourself the question, am I really poor in spirit? And am I really mourning over the realities of that? Because it is that being poor in spirit and mourning basically create the, the circumstance to recognize how meek we should be. And so as we look through the picture of what Jesus is saying by this, we want to examine the word itself. But remember, again, there is a blessing that comes with this. And as we've looked at the blessed state that results in these beatitudes, we've looked at this reality that it is a broken blessedness, right? That broken hearts lead to the blessedness of realizing that there is then the approval of God from his righteousness given to us. That while we can't be good enough and we'll never measure up to the fullness of God's glory, all of us have fallen short of it. The beauty is that Jesus' righteousness given to us allows us to recognize that we can be blessed in him. And by living out these norms of the kingdom, there is a blessedness that results from it. And so as we see with this one, though, remember that that blessing, we we hold it in attention at least. We've we've talked about this truth, and I want to reiterate it again, the already not yet of the kingdom of God, that God's kingdom is already, but God's kingdom is not yet, that we see part of it fulfilled in the coming of Christ, but we will not see all of it completely fulfilled until Jesus returns. And it is true that with meekness, the promise that comes in our meekness, which we'll reflect on in a few moments, is certainly a future promise, a promise for reward for Jesus' followers when all of his promises are fully realized. But there is a blessing 
And don't miss that as we think about these. Because as we reflect on these Beatitudes, we might look and say, that's a hard way to live. Those are hard things to do, right? But much easier when we consider that there's a blessing that comes from God in the midst of it. So remember that when you live out these Beatitudes, you are blessed. So blessed are those who, uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word meek there is certainly as we look at it in the original language, it's helpful to define it. It's a word that means gentle, mild, or humble. But to get the full sense of it, we we look throughout Scripture and we see a few places where that word is seen. In fact, Jesus describes himself in that way. In fact, it's in Matthew where Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus describes his character as being gentle, but it's the same word that we have here for meek. And so it would literally be right to say, as we read that, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Now, as we think about that and being described in Jesus, we certainly know that that Jesus' gentleness and his mild nature did not stop him from talking. It didn't stop him from confronting sin. Didn't stop him from turning over the money changers, uh, the tables of the money changers in the temple. It didn't stop him from lauding the realities of the kingdom and calling people to repentance. And so as we think about Jesus' meek nature, it should not then force us to think that, well, meekness just means that I can never have an opinion about anything. I mean, meekness means I, I can't ever speak up about anything or call out sin when I see it or whatever you insert in there as we think about spiritual things. We, we might have the tendency just by looking at the definition of gentleness or mildness or humility in the midst of that to think, well, that just means to sit to the side, be quiet, and don't ever say a word. That's not meekness as we think about it. We also have a help in that. The same word that we find for meekness here is from the root that we find in Galatians 5.22 where the fruit of the Spirit are laid out for us and we see the picture of them, one of those being gentleness. And so meekness is actually one of the fruit of the Spirit. And so as we combine this together and begin to look at it, it is that it's not in a vacuum that we see Jesus tell us that we should be meek. In fact, it complements many other things we see in Scripture, including the nature of the way Jesus lives. So we see that and we should have priority in it, but realize that meekness is not weakness. But we might think it is. And so that caution that we take, it's it's not a weakness or timidity that leads to us getting run over. That might be where we would naturally go with it. In fact, I think it's helpful. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a preacher uh, many, many years ago in England. He reflects that humility that results uh, in, in meekness, meekness is humility that results in a true estimation of oneself. And that true estimation of oneself comes as they recognize who God is, right, who he is and what he's done for us. And so we see the qualities set out for us that if we are poor in spirit and we are mourning over the reality of our sin, it then leads us to God. And when we recognize that our only hope is found in him, the only hope that we have of righteousness, the only hope that we have of salvation being found in him, it then leads to a certain type of nature from us, a certain way that we approach not only ourselves and the way we think internally, but a way that we then approach the world and how we we go about our business in it and how we talk to people in it. So Martin Lloyd-Jones says that humility, a humility that comes as a result of our our true estimation of ourself being seen, that before the Lord, we should then realize that it is a self-control. Meekness is a self-control based on the realization of the first two Beatitudes. It's a way of living then and a dependence on God that results from them. A dependence on God that results from our 
estimation of ourselves that we are poor in spirit. We have nothing to bring. God has given us everything. And that we mourn over that state which leads us to repent, leads us to recognize, that leads us to approach the world in a certain way. That is the character of meekness that we see in the midst of our lives. And so then it leads to a conviction that we would rest before the Lord. Rest in the midst of everything that is raging around us. Rest in the midst of even the world that we see that as we look at it has gone off the rails. We, we still find rest in that because we're looking to the Lord and it creates a meekness in us. That meekness that's created then allows us to defer to others. And that deferral is an important thing. It, it's something that we would not then demand our own rights or our own prominence, but faithfully trusting in God, we would realize that the reward to come in the end is one given by him. And so we can rest in the midst of these days, not feeling like we have to get all that we think we're due or have ourselves be the ones who rise up. So, so as that then is created in our hearts, we look at others and we can then look at their importance, the importance of treating them rightly so that they would know the gospel themselves. So for unbelievers, as we look and we see them doing everything against what the Bible says, our tendency might be to get loud and boisterous and condemning and just go after them in a way that Jesus never did. But instead, stepping out and realizing all that God has given us all of the grace and righteousness that come from Jesus to us, not based on our worth or merit, but based on who he is, allows us then to look at others and see them in a much different light. The way externally that we see them is created by the, the internal aspect of our own hearts and what we realize before the Lord. And so meekness is a deferral as we give away and so one reflected on it. They said that meekness is a controlled desire to see another's interest advanced before his own. Literally what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, right? Consider the needs, he tells the Philippians, of others more important than your own. In order for the Philippians to live that out, guess what quality would have to be demonstrated in their life? Meekness. Gentleness. Right, those realities would have to be seen in them if they were going to live out what Paul said. But, but notice Paul also reflects on the truth in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2 that what? It is the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. And so we are literally emulating Christ as we live meekly in the midst of our world. I love Charles Spurgeon, you read him, he has a depth of reflection that is just incredible. And here's something he says, because I think this is helpful to us in this whole truth of meekness. We might think that meekness is just something that is internal, right? I mean, meekness is just something that I am. It's just something that's in me. And so we'll reflect on this a little bit further. But Spurgeon says he is not simply meek in himself, Right? He says his meekness is manifested in his dealings with others. Right? It comes out that it is something that, that is happening, right? It is something that is being lived out. It's the way that we approach others. And so we might estimate that, well, I'm quiet in spirit. I don't say a lot. But we're not necessarily meek until that is demonstrated toward others or reflected on as we see that. In fact, Charles Spurgeon, as he reflects on that, he says that it might be that he'd be assumed to still, you know, be a, or one that is meek and, and never demonstrates it outwardly. It's just an inward quality, right, that he might still have pride in his heart. The true demonstration of his meekness is when it's evident in his life, evident in how he approaches others. And so the calling to meekness, this calling to live that out as Jesus is reflecting on it and, and showing it to us, it is a self-controlled way of living that estimates our own worth before the Lord, 
right, of what he's done for us. And then in the midst of that, a humility, a gentleness, a mild nature as we deal with others that comes from that. And so we'll reflect on those things more in just a few moments. But don't miss the last part of this verse. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The earth will be theirs. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can reflect on that. In fact, it's been studied throughout history. We can look back at at those theologians who have commented on it and those kind of things. But it's pretty clear that as we look at what Jesus is talking about here, especially when we take it in concert with the rest of Scripture, that what he is talking about in this inheritance is a future inheritance inheritance. It's something that will come. In fact, it's the new heaven and the new earth promised by God when he finally fulfills all things. What's promised to us at the end of the book of Revelation is is that picture of a new heaven and new earth is described that that will belong and does belong to believers. That is the inheritance that we have been given. And the reality is that those who are meek and that they shall inherit the earth demonstrates to us how these beatitudes begin to kind of bubble up, if you will, inside of us. It is that it's a well that kind of leads to to filling up and filling up and filling up and filling up and then begins to overflow. Because as they are demonstrated, these character traits in the inward nature of us, they begin to, I guess, ooze from us, if lack of a better term, Right? They begin to come out. They begin to be seen. You, you can't hide it anymore, right? And so we want these things and realities to be reflected in the midst of our life. And so Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I'm going to walk through some takeaways as we seek to apply this to our lives, right? I mean, we've talked some about it as we think about the definition of what it is to be meek. We kind of have to talk about a few of the takeaways, but let's do some specific takeaways in applying the quality of meekness to our life. The first one is this. We must have the realization that meekness is an outward demonstration of an inward quality. Now, we've touched on that, and we want to kind of, you know, reflect a little bit further on that. Failure to show it outwardly means that meekness is incomplete in us because the true, uh, I guess, the true the truth that meekness is demonstrated in us or that is present in us will be shown by the way we live toward others. It's going to be seen outwardly. This flies in the face of the statement, and you've seen this, right? It always amazes me to reflect on sometimes people when they get caught in something and, you know, whether it's uh, kind of in a public, you know, sphere or even, you know, something that's less uh, prominent or, or less public. But for certainly in a public, a public individual or an individual who's known, maybe a celebrity or something like that, when they get caught doing something, what's the first thing they say? I regret that my actions do not demonstrate the character of who I really am. And we've heard it. Maybe we've even thought it for ourselves, right? Or said it ourselves. But it is true that what is inward in us must be demonstrated outwardly. And can a person really be meek if that's not being demonstrated outwardly in their life? Or if what's being demonstrated outwardly is is the opposite of meekness, then there's certainly a big problem with that. Spurgeon further reflected as we talked about what we were just mentioning a moment ago. He says, as there is the whole of the Beatitudes a fall parallel with a rise. And so it is here. In the first case, he says, the man that was poor was low. In the second case, the man that was mourning was also low. But if he kept his mourning to himself, he still might seem great among his fellow men. But now he has come to be meek among them lowly and humble in the midst of society so that he is going lower and lower, yet he is rising with spiritual exaltation. Although he is sinking as to personal humiliation, and so he has become more gracious. And it's a beautiful way to demonstrate meekness. It is a graciousness towards others that has come as a result of God's graciousness to us. 
And I hope that you can see that in your life. I hope that you can see how important that is. And so true meekness is not just an inward meditation in the midst of our hearts. It has then become an outward demonstration that others can very visibly see about us. Going back to that case of Sir Edmund Hillary, right? He could have easily just went after that guy and said, don't you know who I am? I know how to hold an an ice pick. I was holding ice picks long before you were ever even born, son. Right? But a graciousness to smile, thank him, and go on about his day. In the midst of our lives, we might want to try to correct and we might want to try to make better. And, and it's not to say that we aren't called to do those things. We are called to be a light to this world and to help it. Right? But you know, like I know, there are a few different ways we can go about anything. Right? And some result in positive things. Some result in negative things, and we need to be careful that how we do that aligns with the calling that we've been given as believers, aligns with the meekness that should be demonstrated in the midst of our lives. So we must have the realization that meekness is an outward demonstration of an inward quality, and we need to work towards, with the Lord's help and with his grace as what we rely on to demonstrate that to others. We must also, the truth number two, we must recognize the deferral that results from our meekness. Instead of wanting to get it all ourselves, right, we should be willing to to give away. Instead of jockeying for our own interest or our own prominence, instead we defer to the Lord and we defer to others. I remember hearing a story of a frog who uh, was in the cold climates and Uh, He saw every year as all of the birds migrated south for the winter. And he said, you know, he's like, I want to try to migrate this year. So he went up to the birds. He said, hey, look, I know you guys go south every year to get a little bit warmer. He said, can I come with you? And they were like, well, how do you expect to do that? He said, you can't fly. He's like, well, he's like, I've got an idea. He said, if you guys will take this uh, stick and put it in your beaks, two of you, and then I can hold on to the, the stick with my mouth and, and I can make it down with you. And so they said, okay, well, we'll try that. And so they got going and everything was going great for a, a long period of time until there was a farmer that was looking up and he saw them flying over and he said, wow, that's an amazing thing. I wonder who ever thought to do that with a frog or who ever thought to grab a stick like that between two birds. And, and just at that moment, the frog opened his mouth to let him know that it was him and he fell all the way down to the ground. We want people to know, right? They, they've got to know. They've got to know that I know what I'm talking about. They've got to know who I am. They've got to know. We have this desire for prominence in the midst of us that would run us right out of deferring to others, that would run us right out of demonstrating meekness towards them. And so in our deferral to the Lord... And then our deferral to others, we defer because Jesus lived that way and he calls us to live that way. And that's why we do it. That's why we live it out. Because we know the reward that he gives will be greater. But as D.A. Carson reflects on this, he says, individually each man tends to assume without thinking that he is the center of the universe. Therefore, he relates poorly to the other four billion others who are laboring under the similar delusion. But the meek man sees himself and all others under God. And since he is poor in spirit, he does not think more highly of himself than he ought to. Therefore, he is able to relate well to others. And that's no matter who they are. That's what meekness is. It's humility before the Lord, a humility in us that leads us to be humble with others and defer to them, recognizing who they are. And then going the extra mile to make sure that we help them in the midst of that. But as Carson reflects, if we think that the universe revolves around us, meekness will never be seen in our life. And he, he defers, that, that man that is meek defers to them regardless of their response because this is part of who he is something given to him by God. So the gentleness and mild nature characteristic of meekness is derived from an incredibly deep place, a deep place in the heart given by the Holy Spirit. And it's a very developed spiritual understanding. 
Those who are meek are spiritually mature individuals because of what is required for us to be meek, what is required for us to do that. And so we must recognize the deferral that results from our meekness and how important it is to live that out. Third, we can't can't forget how our understanding of our inheritance is vital in our understanding and exercise of meekness. Right, we're often so concerned with championing ourselves that we fail to understand that we're called to love others. And many times we, we don't want to be meek with others because we've got to get what's owed to us, right? We've got to get what we deserve. And so many times our, in our loving of them and demonstrating true meekness, it, it means that we might be mistreated in this world. Right? To be meek before others means that we might miss out on a, a few things that we could have gotten had we not been that way things that we might feel like we should have. And I would say that that's probably the biggest obstacle to living meekly is just saying, well, if I do that, they're going to run all over me. I mean, people are just going to run right through me. And so it could be that, that the obstacle to many living meekly is this reflection on how they would end up being treated as a result. And then their anticipation of that keeps them from doing it, keeps them from living that way. But that mistreatment or even our failure to realize all of what might be considered the highest earthly existence will not matter, right, to those who will realize the promise of the kingdom. So meaning that all that we could get here, in light of the promises that we've been given, it pales in comparison. To know that we will inherit the earth, the new heaven and new earth that Jesus will create as believers should lead us to saying, well, man, in this brief moment to be meek is really nothing in light of eternity is it but satan would like to get us to weigh too heavily this moment weigh too heavily this life weigh it far more than what we should and run us right out of meekness because we feel like we're being deprived if we are being meek and so we must be careful that we don't live and think in such a way that dismisses the eternal reality of our inheritance for what is fleeting and temporary in the eyes of men. We can't forget how understanding that the meek shall inherit the earth is important to our practice of it and living it out in the midst of our life. And then finally, don't forget the blessed state that results from being meek. Our blessing is found in what is to come. Our inheritance is in the Lord Right, We receive everything we need and everything we have from him. And so in the reality of living in the here and now, meekness is a trait that would be cultivated because in realization that we're pleasing the Lord by the way that we live when we are living meekly. When we are living that way, when we are deferring to others, we are pleasing The Lord, we are glorifying him. And there is truly nothing greater that we could do in the midst of our lives than to bring glory to God. And so I ask you again, are you meek? Many of us, if we had to answer that today, might frown or might cower because our reflection might be, I'm not very meek. But with the Lord's help, we can be. And in this whole truth that we might run right through life while never considering the qualities of meekness that we should have, that should be evident in our lives, that we should live out before others, there is inserted in the midst of this these beatitudes. That as we read them, as we reflect on them, they point us to what we should be living like and who we should be. And in the midst of our own honesty before the Lord, that this is hard, that this might be a struggle for us, there then comes the grace that we need to live it out, to be these things, to do these things. And so I would caution you, and the biggest caution I would give, you might want to run now as you look at this thing, I'm going to be meek and run to doing it on your own. I'm going to figure out how I have to be meek, and that would be a mistake. Instead, run to the Lord. And ask Jesus to help you in your meekness. To help you to demonstrate this quality. Rely on his grace to be what sustains you 
in that. And through that, may we live meekly before this world. May, as a result, they know the gospel. Right? May we have opportunities to share with them. May we have opportunities to demonstrate the character of Christ through the way that we live before others. And may that mild nature and gentleness of our own spirit as we demonstrate it outwardly draw others to Jesus and may they know who he is. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you. God, that as we have examined these beatitudes, God, they are leading us into truth. God, leading us to see more about why you were, how you were. God, why you lived the way you did as you came in flesh. God, why we see you approach sinners in the manner in which you did. God, how we see you approach, Lord, all things. And so, God, in the midst of our lives, Lord, in in the struggle of even understanding what meekness is, God, we pray that you would enlighten us. God, that we would receive and accept what your word says about it and then realize, God, we're called to live that out. We might struggle in it. It certainly will not be easy. But, God, it is worth it to demonstrate your glory to others. God, would you give us help in this? Would through your grace, God, you provide the strength necessary for us to live this way. God, may the further implications of this meek living, Lord, be demonstrated in our hearts and lives throughout the week. And we ask these things in Christ's name.